Welcome to the HR Empowerment Podcast, where we will uncover strategies and new insights from HR professionals who discuss up-to-date regulations, best practices, and the most pressing topics like diversity and equity, leadership, dealing with difficult situations, and much more that affect your bottom line and business. Thanks for joining us. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Wendy Sellers here, the HR lady. We are here in episode four of five, getting real in 2024. And I'm just going to go ahead and jump straight in and talk about the fact that American politics can cause major work drama. And this year, 2024, is a huge political year and it affects the workplace. So, you know, where do, where the heck do we start? Uh Policies, 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 policies must clearly outline behavioral expectations of your employees. I probably say this till I'm blue in the face on most of our podcasts and anytime I get an opportunity, but you need to look at your policies and make sure that your behavioral expectations are clearly outlined. You need to train your employees on your boundaries what they can say, what they cannot say, what they can wear, what they cannot wear, what they can email, what they can text, et cetera. And then on top of that, and this is super important, you have to train your managers on the same things and then train your managers on how to handle respect and disrespect in the workplace. We want to make sure that we allow for respect respectful conversations, if you're going to allow for political conversations at all. The thing is, um, people ask, you know, hey, isn't talking about my politics or whatever's going on, isn't that just free speech? Not necessarily. Free speech is not actually allowed in private workplaces, which a majority of the listeners today are in private workplaces. So if you're a private workplace, not a government workplace, that's a different conversation. Free speech does not exist. Uh It does exist. It just doesn't exist during their work hours. How people are allowed to speak, how they're allowed to treat others, what they're allowed to say, where, et cetera. That's really up to you and your guidelines. So stop what you're doing today and figure out how do we want our employees to act or react. Now, in the past, I used to be like, oh no, just tell them they can't talk about it at all. Get back to work, we're busy. But as you've made, as we've talked about in the beginning of our series today is that we're hurting for employees. It's gonna continue. Employees are still job hunting and, and jumping ship. And so do we wanna continue to ter- take their rights away and treat them like children? My opinion is no, let's treat them like adults and say, here are your expectations. And if you don't comply with the expectations, these are going to be the consequences. So that's how you can 100% handle the fact of political discourse or political conversations. And the other thing I wanted to say is that the younger generations, they just expect that political conversation is going to happen. And so this has been a trend from the, you know, the oldest silent generations who didn't talk about it, hence their name, the baby boomers. They were taught to not talk about politics or pretty much anything in the workplace. Then Gen X came along and said, oh, we could talk about a little bit. Well, millennials and Gen Z and so on, they're like, no, everything's on the table. And if you stop me from talking about it, I'll go jump ship and I'll go somewhere else. So make sure you understand 100% what you're allowed to have and what you're not allowed to have. And in fact, um, JC just shared with me a recent October survey by Glassdoor. So October, 2023, just a couple of weeks ago, really, revealed that 61% of US employees engaged in political discussions at work within the past year. That's whether you allowed it or not. So super, super important for you to stop what you're doing and figure out what are we gonna allow, what are we gonna not allow? Why? Because if you um, hold one person accountable for wearing, I'll just say a red shirt versus a blue shirt, (laughs) wink, wink, and you don't hold the other people accountable for that, you're going to get accused of political discrimination. And so super important for you to stop right now and talk about that. With that said, I'm not going to go much deeper because I can talk about this forever and I'm going to get all riled up and it's not going to be appropriate. So I did want to ask our co-host here, JC. Hey, JC, how you doing? Hey, Wendy, I'm doing pretty good. I, I do have some recent news here uh, that came out at the end of 2024 in regards to mergers and acquisitions, if you're interested. 
Sure. Uh, came out in 2023, you mean? <laughs> oh, look at me. I'm a time traveler today. What? <laughs> That's, That's hilarious. Right. I have already made that mistake 17 times, and it's only <laughs> the beginning of January. So with that said, yeah, we mentioned a little bit early in our in our series about mergers and acquisitions. So do share this information. Yeah, from, absolutely. I believe the Justice Department. The Justice Department and the FTC have joined have jointly unveiled the 2023 merger guidelines after extensive public engagement. And the goal is to aim and modernize their approach to evaluating mergers and acquisitions in today's complex market landscape. They updated their guidelines. It's a very oh. simple and brief 51 page PDF. And that's, <laughs> that was shaped by feedback from diverse stakeholders and it emphasizes the multifaceted nature of competition, including aspects like price, employment terms, platform dynamics, and much, much more. So if you're interested in that, stop by justice.gov or just uh, hit the Google box and type in uh, justice federal trade commission release 2023 merger guidelines. Now I'm going to pull two of these out here as excerpts for you. And the first one is going to be guideline three mergers. Mergers can violate the law when they increase the risk of coordination. The agencies examine whether a merger increases the risk of anti-competitive coordination, a market that is highly concentrated or has seen prior anti-competitive coordination is inherently vulnerable and the agencies will infer subject to rebuttal evidence that the merger may substantially lessen competition in a market that is not highly concentrated the agencies investigate whether facts suggest a greater risk of coordination than market structure alone would suggest there's a lot there if you don't know what i'm talking about hit up your lawyers i am not a lawyer wendy is not a lawyer if you seek legal counsel it's never a bad thing i'm going to hit you with guideline 10 and throw it back to you wendy guideline 10 when a merger involves competitive buyers the agencies examine whether it may substantially lessen competition for workers creators suppliers or other providers the agencies apply the framework and guidelines one through six to assess whether a merger between two buyers, including employers, may substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. So there's a lot more that goes into this. There's just two of those that are pulled out. It's 51 pages of gold. Uh, the guidelines are, are amazingly all over the place. They cover things from a application of the merger uh, to how the mergers can violate the law if they eliminate substantial competition between firms. And I'm going to skip way, way down in this document. Once you get into uh, chapter four, which is actually pretty intriguing, it's the analytical, economic, and evidentiary tools that they will use uh, to take a look at sources of evidence, merging parties, workers' compensation, uh, market effects on consummated mergers, and more. So big news coming out for you there. I know it's kind of boring for some. It's exciting for me, and I want to share with you. Back to you. No, I think it is exciting. I've I've uh, dealt with a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the past, and you know we started out this series, series four or five, talking about politics and mergers, and this decision is affected by politics. So you know, it's great that you share this because employees and HR need to understand why maybe uh, company owners are making decisions, and it could be because of a future merger, and HR might be the one that needs to have to explain this to employees. Oh so, my gosh! Again. Yeah. How, you know, how, how many times how many times have you sat down in that HR chair knowing that you have to take that offer slip out there and now you've got to go canvas your employee base of thousands of employees and they have no idea what's going on yet at the yep. same time their benefits are going to reset the second that they sign that what do you do yeah what do you yeah. do and it's on you I know it really is. Yeah, you know, transparency is so so important. But let's face it, with mergers and acquisitions, we can't always be a hundred percent transparent because it may spoil the deal. Exactly. Or the two or three companies that are combining might have, you know, an agreement that it's not allowed to be public knowledge until X Y Z blah blah blah. Right. But you know, it getting back to the the topic of politics overall. Just listen, folks, be careful. If you're too strict, you may alienate uh, many people. If you're too loose, you may really upset people that they don't want to deal with politics in the workplace. But do know that people have their rights to um, choose and vote for whoever they want. 
in a public, uh, I'm sorry, in a private organization, they don't necessarily have the right to be running around and gathering that uh, additional voters and the workplace. So know the laws where in your industry and in the type of industry and then in your state that you're that you work or your employees work in as well. And then, of course, if you're a public employer, there's a whole other set of laws that you must know and you probably do know as an experienced HR person. With that said, we have one more episode about um, in our four uh, or five part series about getting real in 2024. In our final episode, JC and I are going to talk about being prepared for 2024 and some general ad advice. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining the HR Empowerment Podcast brought to you by Aurora Training Advantage. We hope you've gained new insight and strategies to navigate the HR profession. We look forward to you joining us again on the HR Empowerment Podcast.